Hello everyone and welcome back. So now we're finally in chapter four of our textbook, going over imperfections in solid. Now, last chapter we talked about all these crystal structures. You know, we were learning how to draw them somewhat. Um, and one thing we ran into is that, well, these are all perfect, absolutely perfect cubes. Nothing missing, nothing out of place, nothing that shouldn't be there. But that's not real. In real life things aren't perfect. So now we're going to get into that. We're going to go from perfection to imperfection now and learn while imperfection can lead to um, poor performance, it can also lead to an increase in performance, or at least it can change the performance in a way we might find desirable. So what do we want to know? Well, we want to know what kind of defects or imperfections we're going to find in solid materials. We want to know how these defects move around. So we'll be talking about vacancies and how those change with temperature. We want to understand what solid solutions are. That's when we have two different materials inside of one another. And we're going to learn about dislocations. That is when our crystal structure gets pushed in ways that it shouldn't have. Finally, we'll learn how we can learn things about our materials through microscopic examination. Now, at some point in time, all matter was plasma. Crazy. And then it got into big balls and you know, we have suns and then they explode and we get heavier molecules and some of those come together into planets. And through some point or other, they went from gas to liquid, finally to solid. Now, in real life, metals don't typically melt in our natural circumstances, though at the center of the earth, they do think there's this giant pall of um, liquid metal. It's kind of frightening to think about. But what happens is, in we realize when we're actually making our metals, when we're casting things, when we're forging things, well, we melt them down, and then they have to be solidified. So there's two steps in this. First, there's nuclei. They form, and they're all little tiny solid particles. You see all these little dots right here, and there's a whole bunch of liquid all around them, a whole bunch of liquid. Now, these nuclei begin to grow, and they grow into, as crystals, and they grow until their boundaries meet each other. So all these little small nuclei grow into big ones, and then they start bumping into each other. And each of these little sections, those are called grains. Grains. So, see right here, the crystals are growing, and eventually they join together into this grain structure. So nuclei come out of the liquid, little tiny solid dots, and then this goes into crystals, then finally into a grain structure. Now, if this confuses you, um, I would suggest that you look up some waters on super cooled, I'm sorry, some videos on super cooled water. Um, super cooled water is when you cool it below its freezing temperature and it doesn't freeze because you have it in a very smooth bottle. The reason it doesn't freeze though is it because it needs some place to nucleate. It needs a point for those crystals to start. And if you have something that's too smooth or there's no imperfections of the water, the water is just too pure, it won't find an imperfection to actually be able to create those crystals. And so it'll keep on getting colder and colder until eventually you shake it or do something to give it just enough energy to start forming crystals. Now this, at least picture right here, might show you why they call them grains. Because um, one, this looks a lot, not 100%, but a lot like what you might see in a you know, piece of wood or something. It is a very grainy texture. Now these grains can be equiaxed, which means they're roughly the same dimension, all dimensions. So think about like little spheres or little squares, or they can be columnar, where they're elongated in one direction. So in this case right here, you can see that we have equiax grains right here at the bottom. There's a bunch of little small dots. And that was due to rapid cooling near the wall of this particular metal. And then in another region over here, you see we have calmer grains because it had slower cooling. Now, why might we get larger grains with slower cooling? Larger grains with slower cooling. Well, what do you think? Okay, I won't leave you guessing. One reason is because of time. 
All these molecules which are getting into grains, they need time to move into position. Perhaps there's a grain over here and this guy really wants to get into that spot and fill in the hole. Well, if he freezes too quickly, he'll get stuck in some position he doesn't like. So we have to make sure that we give them enough time to get where they're going. So the longer the time frame we take to cool, the more movement they'll have um, and the better chance they'll be able to get into a larger grain. They don't want a bunch of small grains. They want large grains if they can manage it. Now, sometimes we don't want them to have larger grains. And so we'll add something called a grain refiner. It's some material, some other um, maybe liquid or impurity that you add to make smaller, more uniform equiaxed grains. Or equiaxed is roughly the same dimension in all directions. Now in this section, you're gonna to have to learn how to see things visually. So be looking for these small dots you see here on the edges, and also these long lines in here. The shapes are gonna be very, very important, so be paying attention to that. Okay, we've been talking about these grains, but what does, it what does it actually look like at the edge? Well, if we visualize all of our atoms as spheres, which is fairly accurate, what you can see here is that they all have the same crystal structure. And it's looking very simple cubic right now, but that's probably just a simplification because this would mean this is polonium. And I would not want to get anywhere near polonium since it's radioactive. <laughs> okay, um, but what we see is that at this edge, there's these little gaps, all these little gaps. And that's because of crystallographic misalignment. Very fancy word for saying that they're just turned. They're not turned the right direction. And this leads to a little bit of disorder. Now, disorder is not necessarily a good thing for a crystal. It can be, it all depends on what you want, but it will lead to high atomic mobility, which might be good, might be bad, and also high chemical reactivity. If you have to get into a point to try to attack one of these atoms, you do not want one that is perfectly constrained in every direction. You want one that has a little bit of movement or at least enough room for you to fit in there and start bonding with it to break that bond. So all of these grain boundaries are places where you'll see a lot of chemical reactivity and a lot of movement. Also, that movement does not have to necessarily be just the atoms. It could be the grains themselves um, just sliding against each other. That's where our defects are going to begin to fail sometimes. Now, the way we tell what's going on in the grain is we look at the angle of misalignment. We just look at the line right here. And we say, well, it should have hit another atom over here, but it didn't because these are angled at a different angle. And that would be my angle of misalignment. You may be required to measure that at times during your homeworks. So make sure you're paying attention to that. And I have something similar over here, an angle of misalignment. Now, you might be wondering, well, why is this not the angle of misalignment right here? And the answer is, we're going to go with the smaller of the two angles. So it's debatable which one of those two is smaller, but you know this is just an example. Okay. I think that's everything. Yes, it is. So thank you for listening, and I'll see you all next time.